Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, we're re recording. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, one second. I'm just going to start a little timer for myself. Okay. Okay, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today's uh, I'm going to be talking about the gear testing of off-bottom haddock trawl. Thank you so much, uh, Gary, for putting these things together. These are awesome. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, so first, I just want to introduce ourselves a little bit more. Uh, I'm with the Conservation Engineering Project, uh, which consists of myself and my boss, Mike Pohl. And as Gary said, we're part of the, uh, the assessment survey program, which is managed by Bob Glenn. So for people that uh, are not familiar with it, uh, conservation engineering generally works with uh, fishing industry members to help them develop, design uh, fishing gear that serves some particular function to improve sustainability, to catch the things they want to catch while avoiding bycatch, or uh, maybe improving their fuel efficiencies, or uh, lately we've been involved in some, uh, some new things as well, uh, such as offshore wind energy stuff. And usually we do our work through, through uh, some degree of federal grants. Okay, so moving on here. <clears throat> okay, so the issues that I wanna talk about um, on this particular project have to do with the abundance of haddock that we have in George's Bank. So as you can see on the, the plot on the, the right here, um, I'm assuming you guys can see my little uh, marker. Um, in recent years, the haddock spawning stock biomass has just shot up uh, massively and we are under exploiting that. In fact, we're only catching about 1% of the allowable catch in recent years. And part of the reason for that is that uh, the, the haddock uh, are hampered by the existence of choke species. That is, choke species are, are those fish that have uh, very low quotas, uh, very low allocations for the ground fish uh, fishermen. So they can only catch so much of say Atlantic cod or yellowtail. Um, and once they get close to that, that quota, they have to make a decision whether they want to lease additional quota, which could be expensive, or they'll stop fishing. And in that case, in either of those cases, it's uh, the haddock catches that would suffer if they can't keep fishing. Um, there's also area restrictions in Georgia's bank, uh, and those have changed somewhat since we started the project in 2016. So in order to harvest haddock, uh, we, uh, fishermen and, and the industry and researchers have uh, helped develop uh, specialized haddock nets. And those nets are designed to catch haddock and avoid a lot of the bycatch and things that they don't want. And the way that these nets typically work is through some behavioral differences between haddock and the other species. So we know haddock start to rise as they're being herded by a net. And then they, they sort of run with the twine before uh, finally, you know, falling back towards the back of the, towards the back of the net. Um, so based on that behavior, if you get the haddock to rise and other things to act differently, then you can sort of separate out haddock from cod and things like that. And there's a number of haddock nets that are applying different techniques, techniques such as very large meshes in the front end or ropes. Um, also nets that are raised off the bottom that are allowing haddock to go into the raised section and other things to go underneath the net. And even separator panels within the net uh, for a fish to sort of ver vertically stratify and fish that go down uh, will eventually be led out of the net. And then there's also a selectivity in the back end of the net and the cod end. And for the ground fish industry, they're uh, uh, regulated to use six or six and a half inch uh, uh, shape meshes. <clears throat> Additionally, haddock caught in a, in a herring fishery. Now the, the herring fishery also occurs in George's bank, uh, but they have their own set of regulations. And rather than use 
uh, what's used in the ground fish fishery, which is a demersal bottom tending otter trawl. I'll get more into that in a little bit. The herring fisheries use midwater trawls, those nets that are in the uh, water column uh, and not touching bottom. Um, but those, that uh, herring fishery has uh, no minimum cod end mesh size, unlike the ground fish industry. So if you're using a small cod end mesh size, generally, if you're catching haddock, you're going to catch smaller sized haddock. Uh, they, they do operate with an incidental haddock uh, cap, 1.5% uh, the uh, ABC. Um, and the, the herring vessels uh, can fish in some areas where the ground fish vessels are not allow allowed. And that's partially due to that lack of bottom contact. So certain areas are closed because ground fish nets generally keep bottom contact. And then finally, haddock seem to have gone smaller in size uh, than they historically were. And that is likely due to this very large abundance of haddock, which causes competitive uh, feeding pressures. That's what we think. So this led us all to the, to the off-bottom trawl project. Um, and I'm going to refer to off-bottom trawl as that or OBT for short. Uh, and we, were going, we wanted to evaluate two designs, two off-bottom trawl designs. And I'll get into what that means in a minute. But I'm referring to them as OBT1 and OBT2. And we wanted to evaluate these off-bottom trawls to land abundant ground fish, mainly haddock, but also we wanted to look at redfish and pollock while eliminating landings of cod, uh, yellowtail, window paint, and flounder as compared against a rule trawl, aka eliminator trawl or rope trawl. That uh, the rule trawl is a uh, is one of the types of uh, haddock nets that currently are permitted to be used. And the rule trawl is um, designed to uh, to catch haddock and avoid things like cod. Uh, and then we wanted to evaluate the impacts of our off-bottom trawls on essential fish habitats and describe these nets under a variety of operating conditions. So the off-bottom trawls are going to act somewhat like a midwater trawl net. And uh, what, we, what we wanted was that they had no contact with the bottom. So this leads to the question, if ground fishermen use gear that don't touch bottom, has a lower bycatch than a standard haddock net, and has a larger mesh cod end than a herring net, can they then, they then fish inside herring areas? So for those that are unfamiliar with uh, some of the basics on trawls, I'm just going to go through some things very quickly here. On the left is uh, what we diagram of sort of a standard ground fish trawl. Uh, vessel pulls doors, which uh, act like planes. And uh, due to hydraulic forces, they spread out to the sides and they spread the wing ends of the net. And uh, uh, the wing ends then connect toward to the headline on top of the net and the foot rope, which uh, is also making uh, contact with the, the, the surface like the doors do. And the headline on a ground, standard ground fish trawl is usually somewhat forward of the foot rope. And then the back end of the net where the fish collect and, and select out for sizes in the cod end. The midwater trawl net on the right side, this is sort of a typical looking picture of a diagram of a midwater trawl net. It's got the same sort of features, it's got doors and a headline foot rope and all that, um, but it's all off bottom, not touching. The headline and the foot rope are generally vertically directly on top of each other and it's a boxier design. Now, what separates the midwater trawl net from our off-bottom trawl is we want to, it to act like a midwater trawl net, but remain very close to the seafloor. Our goal was approximately one meter off the seafloor, nothing making contact. This is one of our off-bottom trawl nets, the diagram on the left and a picture of it on the right. It's a very colorful net. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the different panels 
are just color coded for simplicity so we can really know what we're looking at. Sometimes it gets a little confusing. So for instance, the bottom panel is in, are the yellow twine and the sides are red and green. Uh, the off bottom trawl nets, they're both four seam midwater design. Uh, it means they have an equal head, headline and foot rope lengths and uh, their positions in the water column are equal. Um, and they have extremely large meshes in the body. So towards the forward section of these nets, the off bottom trawl one has, uh, has 12.5 foot meshes in the front end, which drop back to, uh, to smaller sizes as you, as, you head towards the, as you head aft into the net. And the off bottom trawl two is about double that. So we're talking over 26 foot meshes at the front end. So massive, massive size mesh. Um, these nets don't use any floats. And I'll get to why in a moment, but the off bottom trawl one uses a kite on the headline to help add lift. So ground fish, uh, the typical uh, ground fish trawls have floats on the headline to help provide lift. But what really is most interesting about these nets is they use something called helix self-spreading twine. So here's some of the helix twine. This is uh, some of the twine from that bottom panel, the yellow. Uh, and uh, you can see that the, it, it's got an interesting shape. It has coils that are in, inside the twine and the coils will either move in a clockwise or a counterclockwise direction. So it, I've, on the left side there, I've circled the, the two directions of the coils uh, and they're further designated by those little spots on the, on the twine, those red or green spots to tell you which direction the coils are going, help you identify that. Uh, so it, it's very uh, key that you, you have the correct twine piece uh, on each mesh. It's going to have four different pieces of twine or rather two, but the, the, the uh, which, which twine they're next to really matters. So if you reversed it, you would actually end up collapsing the net but because of the coils, uh, you get a, 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 a you produce a lateral hydraulic force as you pull it through the water, which results in a spreading of the meshes. And again, you don't need floats for that reason. Uh, and the floats themselves add drag. So the coil direction is very important. Also, for these nets, we're using uh, some specialized doors called gull wing doors. And the gull wing doors are capable of fishing either on bottom as in a standard net or off bottom like midwater trawling. It depends on how you rig it. Uh, these doors can be quite complex. They require a lot of tinkering. Um, so uh, some practice is needed when you're using it with a new net and a new vessel. On the off bottom trawl one, the doors were set uh, by design to be about midway between the headline and the foot rope. And on the off bottom trawl two, the doors are at a depth equal to the headline. Also, we were able to use a somewhat smaller cod end mesh shape than what's typically regulated with the ground fish fishery. We were using 5.1 inch cod end square shaped meshes. And we needed a letter of acknowledgement to do that for our research. So, this mesh size uh, arguably has better selectivity for the regulated haddock sizes that, uh, that we can now land. So we can now, uh, the size of haddock that became uh, landable uh, essentially decreased over time. Um, and also since haddock seem to be getting smaller, it seems to be a better fit. Also, this matched what the Canadians were using in Eastern Georges Bank Canadian fishery, but that, in Canada has since decreased even further. But because they were using it in Canada, it was easy to obtain that mesh size. It's also a move that's generally supported by the industry and further exemptions are possible uh, to continue using that mesh size. And that mesh size, again, was only used in the off-bottom trawl nets. And I'll get to that again in a minute. So we completed four trips. Uh, for this research. Uh, trip one uh, and two were for the off-bottom trawl one. 
just testing that one particular net. And trip one was a tuning trip. So we spent a couple of days uh, just getting familiar with the net, making sure it's uh, fishing correctly. Um, we used an open cotton, so no catches being landed at that time. And then after we became a little bit more comfortable, we moved to trip two, which was a comparative fishing trip versus the rule troll. Again, a standard haddock uh, regulated net. And uh, from that trip two, we were able to complete 13 paired toes doing alternate hauls. So one net followed by another, essentially. And we were able to pair the catches from that. And then in off-bottom trawl two research, again, we start with a tuning trip, a few days, just getting it to work properly. And then we move into the comparative fishing versus the same rule trawl. But in this case, because the, the adjustments to the door were so substantial when going from the off-bottom trawl two net to the rule trawl or vice versa, it took so much time to make those adjustments, we instead uh, tested each net on a daily, uh, basically a daily uh, mount, and then we'd switch to the other net. So for that reason, we had to pool the toes for trip four. And we'll get to that a little bit more coming up. And you can see a table on the right shows what was actually completed for each net on each trip. Now, the other thing that I need to mention is we didn't have a permit to use the 5.1 inch cotton on the rule trawl. Uh, it was decided that we wanted to see how this, uh, this experimental net and the smaller cotton compared against a very standard haddock net, the rule trawl. So the rule trawl is using a six inch cotton. Here's the toes that we completed. Uh, the boxes in green show uh, what became the, uh, the regulated areas later. Again, changed a little bit over the course of the research. Um, and the colored dots, uh, points there, show each of the trips. So trip one is blue, for instance. And uh, uh, trip the, the trips ones and trip three are our tuning trips. Um, and those were typically conducted in waters that were a little bit more shallow than the comparative fishing trips, two and four. And that's because we only had a few days for the tuning trips. And uh, we didn't want to go too far from port, spend all that time steaming. Uh, so they typically were done at a bit more shallow depths. Uh, to the right is some of the uh, basic results on things like duration, speed that we got from each net, on each trip. But what I'm going to just direct everyone's attention to is a few things. Again, I mentioned the depth on the right side. But we also saw uh, when we're trying to maintain the same speed for all the nets, we ended up with a slightly, uh, well, a significantly higher RPM that was required to tow the off bottom trawl two, okay, compared to the other nets. And this table just shows uh, the sheer number of sensors that we placed on, on the, on the off-bound trawls and also a little bit on the rural trawl uh, because we really wanted to understand what that net was doing as best as we possibly can. Midwater trawls generally are more complex to fish and we wanted to make sure we fish them close to the bottom. So we wanted to have a lot of sensors on. So we could really look at it. This is just demonstrating all the sensors we were doing from door depths and to the X, Y, Z positions of the doors and foot rope heights, et cetera. And we also completed some uh, video captures uh, for these nets. Up on top is from the off bottom trawl one uh, from trip one. And the picture on the left is showing that kite that I was talking about that's connected to the headline. And actually the video was quite helpful in determining what the best position was for the kite and optimal uh, placement and adjustments. And to the right of that, that's actually the foot rope of that off bottom trawl one. And uh, it's a chain. And as you can see, it's actually not touching the bottom at this point. Uh, below that is uh, an image from trip four using the off bottom trawl two. That's a red hake uh, that's uh, about to uh, come into the net. We're moving towards it. And uh, we were able to tell from this video that, again, we're not touching bottom. 
now, at, at some point, uh, we added drop chains uh, forward of the wing ends for both off-bottom trawls. Um, and the reason we did that was because the captain uh, felt that he wanted to really make sure he was close to the bottom. Unfortunately, what this does is when you add drop chains at those points, it's almost certain that the chains are going to be touching bottom. Um, so uh, you could see uh, from underneath those pictures, uh, the off-bottom trail one um, on the trip two, uh, most of those toes had some drop chains added to them. And then most of the toes for the off-bottom trawl two also had drop chains. And uh, those, of course, have some implications. But that's an industry decision. Um, if uh, there's no industry up uptake of this equipment without the use of something like a drop chain, then uh, so be it. Um, and I'm going to now go into some of the results that we got. Um, so this is uh, this is some of our net maceration results uh, for the door spreads. I'm just going to talk about a few of the trips here. Trip two, uh, this is a box plot, box and whisker plot. Um, at the bottom here is trip two, and the green box plots are the off bottom trawl one results over uh, the course of all the toes that we collect the data for. And in pink is the rule trawl. And then we're looking at the averages um, moving through uh, all those toes. And you can see that the off bottom trawl one uh, fishes uh, uh, with a slightly smaller door spread than the, than the rule trawl. Uh, but that's not unexpected because as I said, the, the off bottom trawls are, are more similar to a midwater trawl, so it's more boxy in shape. You'd expect the doors to come in a little bit. So that's about what we wanted to see. Above on trip four, there's a bigger spread between the off bottom trawl two in blue and the rule trawl. Um, and one of the things that we learned from this is the captain actually wanted to get the off bottom trawl to to have a door spread closer to uh, above 80 meters. But uh, based on the design of that particular net and the sheer size of it, um, he couldn't really find water deep enough um, for catching haddock uh, to, to get that spread that he wanted to. Um, and the door spreads affect the shape of the entire net. <clears throat> and here's some more uh, net menstruation results from off bottom trawl one. And there's a lot going on here, but mostly I'm going to direct your attentions to the, the uh, plots on the right. So looking at the bottom trip one, this is from notice data. Um, this is uh, looking at the mean foot rope height in that bar plot over on the right side there. And, uh, you know, again, what, this is an average, uh, using the notice data, we're, notice data, we were able to get an average of the mean foot rope heights um, for every toe. And uh, really, again, the tuning, trip one is a tuning trip. We've got to play with a lot of things, make sure we get things correct. And finally, near the end, toe 17, we felt that we got it at about one meter right there. Um, but it does take some playing with. And then uh, for trip two up above, again, look to the right at the foot rope height. Uh, this is using SIMRAD data, box and whisker plot. And the red dotted line is the average again. And you can see we're very, very close to the bottom. And I'll remind you that toes 11 through 30 here are, have the additional drop chain. So if you look at toes like four, six, and seven near the, uh, the, the left side of that plot, the foot rope's actually a little bit higher off the ground. Again, once again, the captain felt that he wanted to get it a little bit lower. So he put the drop chains on and that's what happened. Similar thing for the off bottom trawl two, trips three and four, just look at the foot rope heights on the right very close to the sea floor. Okay, again, using the SIMRAD data. Um, and I've labeled to the right there where the drop chains are. So if you look at trip four, top right plot there, um, trip toes three through 15, 
um, have the drop chains on. And you can see in toes one and two, a little bit higher off the bottom, same thing. Okay, moving on to some of the paired catch results, comparing the catches from the off bottom trawl one against the rule trawl. Okay, these are equal catch plots. On the Y axis is the catches from the off bottom trawl one, and on the X axis is the catches from the rule trawl. Uh, so these are paired catches again. So typically what, we, what we'd expect to see for haddock is about an equal distribution of haddock on both sides of that diagonal line, or maybe something close to the diagonal line. And that's basically what we saw, okay? Uh, then for a lot of the other species, uh, you look at like monkfish and all the flounders and everything like that, these are bottom tending species, all the skates too, um, because the off bottom trawl it's hopefully not touching the bottom, except for maybe some drop chains. Uh, you'd expect those to be excluded from the net, and that's basically what we see. Cod, both the roll trawl and the off bottom trawl one, they're meant to avoid cod, and um, so we basically didn't catch much. And the off bottom trawl two versus the roll trawl catches, uh, again, had to be pooled. So now we're looking at the averages over the entire trip. Uh, but same, same thing here, right? The uh, haddock should be somewhere up near that center line, which is what we see. And all those bottom tending fish tend to be reduced in the off bottom trawl too. Again, on the y-axis, which I, I should mention is, is more of a logarithmic scales on the axes and the rule trawl on the x-axis. So that, that's basically what we would have expected to see. Going into a little bit more detail about the catch results. Uh, we selected tests for significance based on the results of normality and equal variance. So there's a number of tests that we're using here. What's important to look at is which values fall into the green range and which fall into sort of the red range. So here's off bottom trawl one results. All the green numbers, there's no significant difference between that net and the rule trawl. So that's for haddock, and in this case, American place. And the ones that are significantly different, monkfish, gray sole, barn door, and little skate. And there was no winter skate in the off bottom trawl one. For off bottom trawl two, we see similar results. Okay, haddock, again, no significant difference as expected. Same for American place, but now, Gray soul have flipped for whatever reason. Uh, again, monkfish, barn door, winter skate, no significant difference. Uh, and little skate, there was no catch in, in either net. We also looked at the length frequency results uh, comparing uh, each off bottom trawl against the rural trawl. Um, again, we're using uh, box and whisker plots here. So, Right here, we're looking at the haddock results and we're looking at the length frequency differences between the rural trawl up on top here and the off bottom trawl just below it. And basically wherever these boxes are overlapping show that there's no significant difference. And these length frequencies are almost right on. Okay, the, the uh, vertical lines are the minimum legal size of each fish. Um, in fact, for all these fish, um, there's no significant difference between the catches of the rural trawl and the off-bottom trawl one. Because we were able to pair these toes, we were able to conduct a haddock generalized linear mixed model, and we were able to look more deeply at uh, haddock over every uh, length size here, every length class, and we again see there's no significant difference between those two nets. Looking from trip four compared to fishing trip four using the off-bottom trawl two, same story, okay? Um, no, no differences when, when catches were in both nets, there is no differences between the rule trawl and the off bottom trawl too. This is a very interesting result here because I'll remind you that the rule trawl is using a six inch cotted mesh size and the off bottom trawls are using a 5.1 inch mesh size. So either that means some selectivity is occurring before the fish reach the net, or it doesn't matter, they're still getting out independent of which of those mesh sizes you're using. 
So now just summarizing our results here, for both off-bottom trawls, we successfully maintained net shape and heights off-bottom, eventually. Uh, there unfortunately was some impact to the essential fish habitat because of the drop chains, but it was still likely reduced. Um, foot rope was possible in, in uh, some situations. Um, and because there's contact, it's probably unlikely that the ground fishermen could get into herring areas um, unless they eliminated their contact completely, then maybe they might have an argument. Cod still not caught, it's good. Uh, we weren't able to focus on pollock and redfish. Uh, we didn't have enough time, so we focused more on, uh, on the haddock, um, but uh, uh, not even the roll trawl was catching them. Uh, there was a smaller cut on mesh size, did not lead to higher catches and discards of small fish, and in the even increase in less desirable, smaller, but marketable haddock. For the OBT1, it required a high attention to speed and wire out to maintain the stability. The captain was constantly adjusting uh, the uh, RPMs and, and the wire out and in the wheelhouse. There was no significant difference in the RPMs compared to the rural trawl. And there was no significant difference in haddock and American place catches, but there was difference in monkfish gray sole and barn door skate and all winter skate were eliminated. And skates can be kind of a nuisance for the ground fish industry. For the off bottom troll two, it required less attention than the OBT one during the tow. Uh, it's generally more stable. Uh, it was difficult to obtain the desired door spread due to that sheer size of that, that, that trawl uh, and design. Uh, we believe that it would be better to fish for redfish using this net because they tend to be in deeper water. The captain feels he can get a better spread at that point. It required significantly more RPMs than the rural trawl and therefore the off pond trawl one, likely due to the large fishing circle and helix twine. And there was no significant difference in haddock, American place, and gray sole catches compared to the rural trawl, but there was a significant reduction in monkfish, barn door, and winter skate. Um, we also found that the back end of that net was not really durable enough for this region. That this net is typically used in Europe and Scandinavia, um, but in this net, we had a, a moments where we would have a, some breakage uh, based on the back end twine. The captain thinks we can improve that by using spectra, but that's a little bit more costly. And we also need to mention that we did capture some common dolphins in that very, very large net um, that we did not see in the rule trawl. <clears throat> so that's it. Uh, this project was funded through the SK grant. Uh, Mike Paul also receives salary support uh, under the uh, NOAA IJ award. Um, the project was originally led by DMF and uh, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, but later completely picked up by DMF. And we had uh, further collaborations with fishing tech industries, with SMAS, I see Pingo's in the meeting, him as well, and some GMRI participation. All right, thank you, and uh, any questions?